Hello and welcome to Scripture Verse by Verse. My name is Michael Moret. We're in the Gospel of John, chapter 1. We resume our study in verse 28 today. So get your Bible if you can and open it up to the first chapter of John. Just a reminder to you that the Scripture Verse by Verse website is found at thebibleversebyverse.com. And there you can study all of the Bible with me, just like we're going to do today. Using my audio Bible messages there, there are four complete series going through the Bible, 35 years of teaching. You choose the series, then book of the Bible, the chapter, the section, click and listen. That's at the Bible, verse by verse dot com. Okay, let's pray. And Father, we ask that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Hope you have your Bible open to John chapter 1, verse 28. These things were done in Beth Bara, beyond the Jordan, where John was baptizing. Talking about John the Baptist. 32, still talking about John the Baptist. It says, John bore a record saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it abode upon him. Jesus is the Messiah. And John was given a sign by the Father. Out of all the hundreds, maybe thousands of people, that John baptized. The Messiah would be known by John and he could then introduce him to the world personally by the fact that a dove would land on him and stay on him for a period of time after he was baptized. That's how John would recognize who the Messiah really was. So let's read Um, verse 29 and then 30. The next day, John saw Jesus coming unto him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God, who taketh away the sin of the world. Actually, let's just stop right there. John pointed out Jesus, not just as the Messiah, but as the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. You see, the substitutional death of Christ for our sins was taught in the Old Testament. And John knew the Bible. And that's why he was able to proclaim Jesus as the Messiah, God's offering for sin. Jesus, God's eternal Son, became the sacrificial offering on the cross that paid for our sins. Not everybody takes advantage of that, but everybody could. Only those who repent and receive Christ as Lord and Savior take advantage of the fact that Jesus paid for their sins. The rest of the people, sad to say, the majority of people, die, go to hell, and spend forever and ever satisfying the justice of God by paying for their sins in the lake of fire. It's not the way God wants it, but that's the way it is. 30. This is he of whom I said, After me cometh a man who is preferred before me, for he was before me, and I knew him not but that he should be made manifest to Israel. Therefore, have I come baptizing in water. Now, John the Baptist baptized people with a baptism of repentance. People came to him and were baptized, symbolizing that they wanted their sins washed away, symbolizing also that they had repented of their sins so that their sins could eventually be forgiven. 
But that wasn't the only reason that John baptized. He baptized because this was the way that God the Father, through John the Baptist, would introduce his son, the Messiah, the Savior, to the world. So 32, and John bore record saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it abode upon, it abode upon him, and I knew him not. But he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same as he that baptizeth with the Holy Ghost. So, as I alluded to a few minutes ago, God said, John, when you baptize a man and you see a dove descend and land on him and stay on him, who knows how long, he's the Messiah. That's the one. That man is my son, the Messiah. And like I said last time, I'm, I'm sure John the Baptist probably wondered every time he baptized a man, is this going to be the guy? It's going to be the Messiah. But the only one that a dove ever landed on was Jesus. And then John knew the Lord Jesus Christ was a son of God and the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And you can know it too. That never happened with anybody else that John baptized, which is another way of knowing that Jesus is the only Savior. If you're trying to get to heaven, apart from Jesus Christ, you can find yourself out of luck. And on Judgment Day, it's going to be too late to do anything about it. <clears throat> Verse 34, and I saw and bore record that this is the Son of God. So as soon as that dove landed on Christ, John began to bear record of what that meant. He didn't waste any time. He had his marching orders. When the dove lands on that man, start proclaiming him as my son, the Messiah. And John didn't waste any time. He got right at it. He bore witness to the fact. Now this was, this was a point where John's ministry really turned a corner because before this, he was baptizing people in the baptism of repentance, telling them about the Messiah who was soon to come. But now he's pointing them out. He's just taken that extra step in his ministry, you see? He's not just a prophet now, prophesying the coming of the Messiah. He is a witness to the fact that the Messiah is here. Everything has changed now. Verse 35. Again, the next day, John stood with two of his disciples. Let's stop right there for a second. Notice that the disciples here had been disciples of John the Baptist, but not for long, 36. And looking upon Jesus as he walked, he said, behold the Lamb of God. So notice what John does, and this is so wonderful. This is why John was called the greatest of all Old Testament prophets by Jesus himself. Because notice what he does here. He's got two disciples, two of his followers, and the moment he sees Jesus the next day, he tells his, those two disciples, hey, that's the Messiah. He pointed them to the Lord Jesus Christ. Any preacher, pastor, evangelist, minister, whose goal is to make people think that he is witty and oh so smart, oh so intellectual, cute or funny, ought to get out of the pulpit, their so-called ministry, go to Hollywood and try to get a job in the movies or something. 
show himself to be the contemptible person that he is for trying to draw people's attention to himself and impress people with himself rather than pointing people completely, totally, 100% to Jesus Christ. If you are following or listening to a pastor who in his sermon, you leave on Sunday morning, or you get done listening to him online or whatever, and you think, wow, you think thinking more of him than you are of Jesus? You better not listen to him anymore. You better not go to his church anymore. You better not support him anymore because he's wrong. When a preacher gets done preaching, and a Bible teacher gets done teaching, people ought to be thinking about Jesus. That's what made John the Baptist great in the eyes of God. Verse 37. <clears throat> and the two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. And there you have it. They followed Jesus. As soon as these two men knew who Jesus was, <clears throat> they followed him. You know why? It's because they were hungry for truth. And when you're hungry for truth, you will follow it when you hear it. You'll recognize it, you'll know it, and you will follow it. Now, you might not follow it to perfection, but you will follow it and you'll want to follow it to the best of your ability because you love truth. These two disciples love truth. They didn't care what truth was as long as it was truth. The truth had been they belonged following John the Baptist earlier. But now the truth has evolved because the Messiah is on the scene and they didn't care if they had to change because it was time to change. And they responded to the truth. You don't have to force feed spiritual truth to real Christians. You don't have to manipulate them into doing what the Bible says. You don't have to argue with them or debate them into believing the word of God. I have never done that in my entire life. I give out the truth because I know that God's people who love truth will respond positively to it. Now, if you have questions, I'll be happy to do my best to answer those questions. If you're sincere, but sincere people, when they hear truth, will respond to it correctly, as they did right here. 38. Then Jesus turned and saw them following and said unto them, What seek ye? And they said unto him, Rabbi, which is to say, being interpreted, Master, where dwellest thou? If you wanted to be the disciple of a rabbi back in those days, you had to stay with him all the time. It wasn't an hour a week or a half hour a day or anything like that. I mean, you had to live with that rabbi. That's what it meant to be a disciple. You lived with him. So when they asked Jesus where he lives, where he was staying, they were saying, we want to be your disciples. We want to go with you. We don't want to just listen to your lecture every now and then. We want to go with you. We want to be your disciples. Because disciples learned by not just listening to their teacher, in this case, Jesus, by, but also by observing. 39. And he said unto them, come and see. They came and saw where he dwelt and stayed with him that day, for it was about the 10th hour. These two men were as imperfect as the rest of us. And we'll find that out. But Jesus knew they were sincere. And so he invited them to follow him. Jesus never turns anyone down. No matter how bad they have been in the past, the important thing is how you want to be right now. And they wanted to be with Jesus. They wanted to live with him, be his disciples, absorb everything from Christ that they possibly could, not just listen to his teachings, but 
Observe how he lived and how he applied the word of God. And that's how he would formulate them into being his disciples indeed. And nothing has changed today. That's still how we become our Lord's disciples, by spending time with him. You cannot be a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ, useful to him in any way, if you reserve him to 45 minutes or an hour on Sunday morning, and most of that probably being entertainment. You, you cannot become a disciple, a true follower of Jesus Christ, by giving him five minutes of devotional time in the morning a day. It's not going to work that way. You got to you got to stay with him. You got to be mindful of him as much as possible throughout the day no matter what else you're doing. And you got to spend time in the word every day and in prayer. The Bible says pray without ceasing. Be in fellowship with Jesus through your prayer and through the word of God whenever you can throughout the day and before you go to bed at night and the first thing you do in the morning, you got to stay close in that relationship. That's how you become a disciple. We are changed, the Bible says, from glory to glory into the image of Christ as we look at him in the word, as we spend time with him. So that's how you become a disciple of Jesus Christ, just like, just like James and John did. And we'll stop right there. Study the whole Bible with me verse by verse using my audio Bible messages at thebibleversebyverse.com. Choose, click, and listen. That's all you have to do. If you'd like to be a part of this ministry that has been faithfully teaching God's Word now for over 35 years, the whole counsel of God without watering it down, you can be by praying for me and God's Word. And also, when you take a break from studying at thebibleversebyverse.com, go to the front page, Click the donate button and prayerfully give as the Lord may lead. Until next time, Michael Moret for Scripture, verse by verse. Thank you for spending this time with me. So long, everyone.